Uh, so yeah, I was just kind of briefly giving my background um, of, yeah, working at Microsoft, Dropbox, Google for automation, test AI, and then uh, most recently DevTools AI, where we've been doing some really cool stuff. So just do a quick time check so that we can all get out for lunch on time. But um, so really the, the main problem is DevOps has been too successful, right? Um, so if you've seen the trends in the last five, 10 years, the release cycle has just been increasing. More and more uh, ships go out every time. Uh, we went from you know week week long, quarter long, if you're still at Salesforce um, releases, down to you know uh, daily, hourly type of things every PR. And so uh, you know uh, who is this that did this? Uh, Deloitte um, and uh, uh, Dora did uh, a release or a DevOps survey and found that you know we're going and shipping 106 times faster. Um, we're doing 208 more pushes per year. Um, so just everything is accelerating and it seems to only continue that trend more and more. And so that's awesome in terms of, you know, getting features out there, um, checking all of those aspects out, getting it to your customers. However, what it's causing is on the quality side issues where essentially now you have this giant coverage gap. So as you're releasing, um, you're not necessarily releasing a feature, you're releasing a feature flag. And then you control that in the back end. So now your production actually has uh, exponential amount of variables. So you have to consider testing, you know, feature A on, feature B off, feature A on and B on, et cetera. But as you start doing more and more feature flags, that just makes your test uh, surface area that much harder uh, to look at. And so this is a huge, huge problem in automation. Um, how do you actually make sure that when you release, um, it's actually going to go well. <laughs> and so, you know, and then not only that, but how do you make sure that um, when you are testing all these different permutations, all these different variations, that it's not flaky because of these flags, right? So in, in, in historical or, you know, last 10, 10 plus years ago, it was a little bit easier, right? Everything was either on or off um, when you go test. And so you knew the state of the system. Now when your tests run, you're constantly stuck, uh, you know, guessing what is, you know, the state of this. You have to deal with test maintenance, <laughs> test flakiness. You have to build tests that are robust and able to handle that. And even Google um, has a two-part series on their blog, if you want to read it, about how they're tackling this, because they see this at scale, right? Um, millions of tests running thousands of times every day. Um, and then I think everyone here is probably aware, but just um, was at Google, we did we did some research on this of, you know, what does the cost to actually fix a bug? And so if you can get it within 15 minutes of when it's introduced, so developer writes writes a feature, writes something, and you can catch it within 15 minutes. On average, it took about two minutes for them to fix it. If it was uh, something that they did yesterday, so the test took too long, they were flaky, you had to rerun it, it took about 30 minutes to fix a bug of, you know, similar length. And so this is kind of correlated into very small changes that you could see of bug fix for a PR was a couple lines. If it was a week, it took about 60 minutes. And if month, oh man, three plus hours. And the and the reason is because developers have to cognitive, have a cognitive yeah, overload, yeah. right? They have to cash in what they were doing. What was this exact line of code? If you can get them in that first 15 minutes, it's a lot easier for them to actually remember it. Uh, if it's something one month ago, I don't even know what I was doing one month ago. And so it's like remembering that, remembering the state, remembering what that you know ticket was, all of that just takes a whole lot more time. And that means a whole lot more money as well. And so um, the goal really is in all these uh, releases, fix bugs early, catch them as early as you possibly can. Um, so I, I propose that, uh, you know, and AI is the way to do that. And so just the definition of a artificial intelligence is that it's a shift. You aren't teaching a computer, right? So you aren't setting a, doing a set of rules like you traditionally would. Um, so if you were for say um, uh, testing, or building a classifier for cats versus snakes or something, right? You maybe would set a set of rules. If it has fur or hair, it's a cat. If it has no legs, it's a snake. You know, you basically hard code that. What's cool about artificial intelligence though is you don't have to teach it the rules. You just give it a bunch of examples, training examples, um, which are like testers, just edge cases, core cases, things like that, right? There's a lot of overlap between testers and artificial intelligence. And the machine figures out those rules automatically. And that's a big, a big shift. And so the other big shift in that is you're going from, you know, 100% predefined set of actions. You 100% know a snake is a snake because it has no legs 
Two, you have to trust that the machine can actually learn um, how, how to define what a snake is. But the benefit of, of that, right, is you don't have to have every snake ever, you know, documented and classified and make sure it works. If you can get, you know, a good enough training sample size, it'll learn what snakes are, um, even if you don't have all the existing examples. And so it's this really fine balance of, you know, how, do you need to know every scenario that's possible under the sun um, and have that time? Or can you go ahead and give a, you know, be, be comfortable with a 97.6% certainty that it is that way? Um, and that's sort of the trade-off I think that you're gonna see with these AI systems. So just within um, the AI systems, there's a couple different types of, types of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So the first one um, is, and I think this is mostly what people are common or correlated it with is predictive ML. So I call predictive ML as anything that you use the model to predict. So that snake versus cat versus dog type of example, right? That's predictive. You take an image, it has to be one of these things and you've trained it on all of those things. Um, other examples though are OCR. So being able to take an image, um, grab out the text and uh, things like that, object detection. So being able to understand what are the different objects within an image. So people's faces, animals, et cetera. And so this is kind of a, a visuals visualization of that where you know you can take an image and grab out all the, the people the dogs the cats the, the bikes etc segmenting that image uh what we're seeing now and if you're in the news uh, a lot of it's this generative uh machine learning so this is it takes some input and generates a completely new output and so you actually want that output um of this and so you're seeing this all the time with like dolly mid journey things like that where it's you know it gives it you give it a text prompt and it actually just outputs an image for you. But um, there's also things where uh, cases, buzzers, for instance. So you give it a whole bunch of inputs, you train it so that it learns what your API is, for instance. Um, it can then go ahead and you know output all the permutations for every API that on your system automatically. There's also test case creation. So um, again, you can give it a set of test cases and it will then generate all the other test cases for you. Um, and so I just had fun with this one. Um, so I, I use Midjourney, and so I gave it, you know, what is the Pacific Northwest Quality Conference? And so these are actually AI generated uh, pieces of art for that. And so it's it's interesting, right? Um, it's probably never seen this prompt before in its life, but it kind of goes, okay, Pacific Northwest, it has, you know, Mount Rainier, kind of gets that color scheme of a little gray, a little orange. So it's it's kind of interesting that it can, you know, look at um, and take, take that text prompt, kind of understand it without ever having to, you know, see the PNSQC logo, um, kind of know what that is and, and generate this. Um, so this is just kind of another fun one. I was, I was bored on the flight over. So, um, <laughs> but I just said, uh, you know, what is a, a testing robot? And so just, you know, again, different variations um, of what it thinks a, a testing robot might be. But again, takes in a prompt and can generate this, this for you, which is really cool. Um, Last piece is uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, this is another field. It's uh, you saw it a, a lot more a few years ago, where you would see OpenAI beating uh, top uh, esports professionals um, using nothing but uh, machine learning. But this is also what they're doing for self-driving cars. Essentially, the the key is you you train it by saying you get a reward if you get to a certain state. And so an example here that might look familiar to certain people in the room um, is, sorry, it's, uh, Jason Arbin's slide, I stole it from him. Um, but essentially if you had an app, let's just say, um, and so you, you wanna have a, a bot that can go from your home screen to the cart. And so you give it a reward if it finds the cart screen. And so with that, you say, hey, bot, you get a hundred coins if you can uh, to start, but every move you make uh, costs you a coin. And so, you know, it starts exploring and maybe it goes to the product, product page, uh, that costs a coin, and then it goes to the card and gets its reward. It's like, oh, cool. I, I now have 99 coins left. Um, but you keep doing this. You keep, it keeps learning. And eventually it says, oh, I know that I can go from the homepage to the card screen. And everyone's like, ta-da, that's, that's pretty simple. But what's cool about that is it actually remembers, right? So within reinforcement learning, it'll know that, I've seen before I can go get to the cart, not just from the home screen, but to a, uh, from the product screen, from the search screen, it starts to build this map and it starts to know then, hey, if, if this flow is broken, it can't find this particular test case um, or this particular button, this action, it'll keep trying until um, 
it goes in, but it's not going to be random. It's going to be using everything it's seen before uh, to do that. And so this is I think, particularly important for things uh, like we were discussed, AB flights, uh, temporal things like you can imagine pop-ups or ads that maybe traditional tests get ruined by this where, you know, you want to go to Amazon, you get a pop-up, the test breaks because they can't, can't find the search box or something like that. Um, so uh, you can apply it in that. So but going through just some specific applications within uh, testing itself. So I um, was doing this this morning on the New York Times homepage. So anyone want to take a guess at how many uh, elements are on the New York Times homepage from HTML objects alone? Billions. Billions. <laughs> uh, yeah, thousands. Uh, it was uh, 1800 uh, or 1762, I believe. Um, you know, so any traditional UI automation has to go through and iterate six, 1762 different objects on the screen. But to all of us, we could probably count, you know, about 50, 60 different things that we would say are, you know, there are the logo, the login button, the image, the title, et cetera. And so you can actually go ahead and use an AI system to just take a screenshot and say, find the core pieces, um, the core elements on that screen and, and return those. So you can then reduce your surface area from you know 1700 plus elements down to 91 in this particular case. But it's really cool in that these are you know trained based upon what people think are interactable and interesting things on that page. So it's, it's a user representation of this, this testing problem. So what are the things that it's interacting with? Oh, a menu, a search, the different links, the title. These are things that you, if you were a, a, you know, testing the New York Times, a QA engineer, an automation engineer for the New York Times, you'd probably want to highlight these things. But you maybe don't have, you know, the, the developer support to put in, you know, test date IDs or things like that. So this allows you to kind of in a gen very generalized way, say, what would an end user see, pull those out and then do verifications or actions on those. Um, uh, you can take it a step further though. Um, and you can actually say, not just what are the elements um, that are interesting, but then classify them. So things like search boxes, uh, microphones, menus, et cetera. Um, these all look generic. Under the hood, they, they're different app to app, right? Um, depending on how a developer implements them. And so these also change over time. So as the app gets rewritten to, from you know, ASP.NET to React, for instance, um, the, all the keys, all the automation that you have change, even though to an end user, this all looks the same. So being able to you know, take a screenshot and use element identification within uh, a screenshot, you can actually go ahead and, and say, hey, what is this element fundamentally to an end user? And if that changes, then alert me, right? So if if a test case is to go to the menu and go to settings or something, right? Do you care if the underlying, you know, resource ID changes from menu box to menu underscore box? No, does it still click? That's the really important piece, right, of this test case. And so if you can look at an app for, as an end user, then you can execute a test as an end user using automation, which has always been the goal. And so um, with, with visual AI and the advances that you're seeing today, you can actually do that. Um, so this one's a, a really cool one. Um, so this is uh, navigation. So, you know, I was showing you earlier kind of a simple example. Um, so this is something that we did at Test AI, where essentially we, we gave this bot a reward to find the terms of service within the Google app. So how did we define in terms of service? Well, we just said, hey, it's a page. It's probably going to have a title of terms of service. Um, we didn't code anything. No human did any interaction with this application. We would just let the bot crawl on it um, and learn. So you're seeing a live example. This is the iOS app. Um, and we just said, here's a reward. Uh, you get a, a hundred you know, martinis or whatever on a, if you can find the terms of service and just let it optimize itself. And so you can see here, it's playing around. It does a search. It clicked into an article on the Google app. Um, it's going to just kind of play around and it's building this whole app graph automatically. Again, the coolest part of this, no human involved in it at all. It's just kind of learning this application, um, seeing what it can find, uh, going all autonomously. And eventually what you'll see um, right then is it starts to learn, oh, how do I get to the terms of service? And then it'll start optimizing that as well. So you can see it's starting to get a little closer. It's saying, okay, I'm getting into the, some of the menus, playing around, um, scrolling, seeing if it's down there. Um, but the, the coolest part is um, 
it actually is just remembering everything it's done. It says, okay, I went down this rabbit hole. I didn't get any reward. I didn't see anything that even looks similar to a terms of service. I shouldn't do that again. I went down this one. So you can start to see it's like, okay, I've done a lot in this main core menu. Let me try, you know, the bottom tabs. Let me try the upper tabs, things like that. It's really kind of looking um, almost, almost a little human-like, um, just trying different things. And so uh, this video is just a, another 45 seconds here sped up a little bit, but the cool part is we traded a uh, compute time for human time. And so boom, it just found it. So it said, okay, at the end of it, cool. I got it. It got its first reward. And so it remembered it was up in that, you know, menu area, but it couldn't quite remember where it's at. Um, so it plays around kind of still exploring, trying out different things. Um, then here it'll find it and really start to remember it. So. Oh, cool. Found a terms of service again. All right. So now it's like, okay, I think I got this. And so now it says, okay, terms of service, got that, really nailed it. I got a huge reward. Is there a more optimal path? And we basically said, stop training once you do the same path uh, two times in a row. And so once it figured out this is the path, um, it, it doesn't do that. So again, what's cool about this is it was a two minutes video, but it was two minutes a human didn't have to do anything, right? Uh, we just set it there. We gave it a whole bunch of different test cases like this. But it, again, we trade uh, compute time, which we had, uh, how many phones does it take to pay an engineer's salary, right? Um, you just let those phones run and then you can get an entire test suite um, that's fully robust. It knows the entire application and it required no human to write a line of code for it, um, for that test case. You can, um, however, so we gave it, that was a simple reward. We just said, hey, you get a reward if you get to this page, but there's more advanced reward things, right? Um, uh, so here's some examples as well of things that we did at test AI, where um, we gave it a reward and said, hey, you get a reward if you increase the score on Candy Crush, um, or you get a reward for points within, um, I think this is Call of Duty that we were doing on mobile. And so it's, you know, just kind of learns the different actions that it can do, uh, gets a reward for Call of Duty, I believe it was a uh, number of unique screens, because we just wanted it to play. We didn't necessarily need it to win, but we wanted it to kind of be active and involved. So it figured out how to generate different screens by playing with the knob on the left um, and, you know, just kind of trying to rotate and move around and found a bunch of different screens. Um, so these are all different types of rewards that you can do. You don't have to do just very basic pieces. Um, there's also test auto test generation. So this is an example um, here. Let's hope it plays. We're, so what we did is uh, we, we trained a bot and so we launch a, a screen. I think we did Amazon for this. And basically we just said, go to Amazon. It takes a screenshot of Amazon and then says, what test can it auto generate? And it um, looks at the screen, breaks it down, similar to what I was showing you before and starts to say, hey, let me generate test cases for it. And so on the right-hand side of this, what you'll see is um, just standard Python Selenium code, but it starts auto generating it as it works a test case. It says, oh, I see a, a search box. So it just says, okay, well, I'll write uh, a finder, a locator for the search box, and then I'll go ahead and send some uh, Nike shoes search. Okay, what would be the next step in this test case, right? Based upon what it's seen search test cases, it's gonna click on a uh, search result. Um, so, okay, let, it adds another one for finding what is a generic result. So again, no human involved in this test creation at all. Um, and it just learns based upon what it's seen from other tests before. And all it's doing looks purely at uh, just visual visual screenshots, visual uh, pieces. Uh, Dione Santiago, who's I think giving a workshop as well on Wednesday, um, has done very similar pieces. Um, he's did this with uh, LSTMs, long-term, short-term memory. He trained it on all the test cases that they had at, uh, on uh, their system. And then what it did is it actually learned, okay, given these tests, what are other areas within this? And so an LSTM is an interesting approach to the same problem where essentially you can, the, the high level of it is you could let it read the first four chapters of like Alice in Wonderland, and then it can write the fifth one. So they, what Dione did, which is really cool, is he, he did the first you know, uh, set of test cases, you know, 500 test cases, and it wrote the next 100 test cases to look exactly like the first one. Those aren't generic. Those were specific to his company, his need, and it came out with some really interesting results. And so being able to apply this both either in general, like this video, or you know, more specific for a particular uh, use case, uh, both are possible and both have a lot of really interesting implementations or implications. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, the other piece uh, around this as well is uh, test selection. So Google did a big blog post on this, um, but you know what they said is again, cost to find a bug is is really high, but they have you know thousands and millions of tests that they have to run. And for each individual uh, pull request, they have to spend a whole bunch of time spinning up machines, running the tests. Those all take a lot of time. So what they started doing is saying, could we use machine learning and leverage that uh, for uh, finding what tests to run and pre-submit? And what they found is they could. Um, so they what they did, they looked at the corpus of all their um, uh, pull requests. And they said, they segmented and said, okay, well, which, which of these tests or which of these pull requests had a history that looked like this, where they write code, they send it, a test failed. They then, you know, send a new PR that has, you know, much smaller and that test starts to pass. And they start, they use that as the training data and they started to find, oh, this code highly correlated to this test because it was broken. They fixed, they did something in this area and it started passing. And so they built this correlation. And so you know, train this over, you know, the entire corpus of all of Google, and they were actually able to find, hey, a machine learning model actually works um, in reducing, I believe it was 50% of the, the tests um, that they execute. Um, and they had 73% accuracy on that. So this was just pre-submit, but they were able to save, you know, 50% of the uh, time on pre-submit. And so the developers were able to catch bugs and the tests they ran were uh, higher efficacy. The other interesting thing that they found within it is, a number of tests that had just were terrible and they were able to pull them out because it was just a waste of time and CP resources. Tests that never failed, right? Um, always green tests are just as bad as always flaky or always broken tests because they're not actually testing anything if that's, if that's the case. So they were looking at those and saying, oh, these ones are just testing functionality that doesn't matter. Did the page, you know, is there anything, is a non-empty string from the, the web server, right? Something like that. Yeah, there's always going to be something. It might say it's broken. Uh, that would be a better test than you know checking just uh, that the string isn't wrong. Things like that. Um, yeah. So I also wanted to just give a, a quick demo. So uh, you know, if you wanted to use AI in testing today, um, you can um, do it today for free. Uh, so this is just our our company, but there's a lot of other cool uh, companies out there where essentially you can just write a, a quick test case. Um, using Selenium, WebDriver, Playwright, et cetera. But you can go ahead and integrate um, uh, AI within these today. And so this will be open source by the end of the year. But essentially you can just say, instead of a traditional selector, you can kind of use all these techniques and tools that uh, we've been talking about and just say, hey, find an element using uh, visual AI. You can call it whatever you want and build your own custom selector. And so um, you can see uh, all the SDKs are open source of how it's done. And then the back end is, is all also um, going to be open source, but you could build your own back end for this. And essentially, you just say, oh, find for github.com, for instance, find a sign in button, find a username field, find a password. Um, and then, you know, click the sign in button, enter username value, enter a password. And so I, this is one of the views of, of where uh, testing in the future is going to be going um, is you don't have to build, you know, core locator strategies anymore. You can actually just say visually like an end user, where is this, um, you know, where's this value? And it doesn't then have to matter what changes under the hood, you know, the app was rewritten, um, any of those aspects, you can just go ahead and say, you know, find this visually like an end user, click it, interact with it, et cetera. Um, but this starts to solve some of the issues that you see around, um, uh, uh, code maintenance, code maintainability, uh, things like that, where uh, developers flipping a flag, like if an end user doesn't notice it, does it really matter? Um, probably not. And so this was always, you know, kind of the intention of automation is to emulate what a manual QA, manual tester is doing. And so uh, the hardest part of this has been, how do you actually get the, the technical code components within that? So this was just how easy it is. You just draw a bounding box over these various elements. Doing a bad job, I think, demoing this, but um, you can just draw it, and that's how easy uh, it is to find those elements on the screen. Cool. Yeah, I wanted to kind of also just open it up. This was meant I uh, got a little nervous and started talking fast, but I wanted to open up to any questions that people maybe have as well. Yeah. yeah. So actually, that's how First one I really want to start with is as you look at what the AI is 
fault. And this, you know, and we know in testing there's things like coverage uh, of various kinds. And, and typically, we want to see higher numbers and things that have not been tested at all. Tested, tested at some point. Have you looked at what it's meant? So the question. The question the question is, is uh, have we looked at what is missing um, from these systems in, in AI and, uh, you know, in a statistical uh, piece, correct? Yeah, I think, um, so yeah, there's there's different statistical methods that you can use for um, uh, precision and recall. So precision being, how precise is it? How, if it says it's a dog or a cat, how many times was it actually correct in, uh, when it says that? And recall is, how many times was there a dog on the page and it, called, and it found that it, it was a dog? Um, and so you can statistically look at that and each model varies depending on those, but you can use that for both, um, for, uh, you typically break down all the data you have into a training set, which is used to train the model and then a test set, which is then used to evaluate how well that model is working. And so, um, those are numbers that you'd look at from that. I think in a more meta sense though, uh, what it's missing, I think you're going to start to see here in the next couple of years, um, is, uh, more of that human element that he people bring of, not necessarily it's working, it's not that binary aspect, but how well it's working, right? In a more meta sense is, you know, humans can take in all these variables of the page was slow, there was this jankiness, there's this, you know, these other weird aspects. And I think you'll start to see um, coming soon, AI that can actually say, oh, it, it doesn't feel right. It does, this login page doesn't feel trustworthy. It doesn't, you know, the color scheme doesn't doesn't match or something isn't right. Those, those human type feelings and be able to quantify that. I guess I was also asking about errors found and reported and down the road errors that weren't found, essentially missed by the data. Uh, there hasn't been anything published uh, so far. I think from our internal data and, and testing, we find that it's in the high 90s. So what we did is um, we looked at web pages, for instance, on uh, the Wayback Machine. And so that allows you to uh, look at uh, what did a web page look like 12, 18 months ago. And so we trained models on uh, that using our system, for instance, and said, this is the web page from 18 months ago. Um, what does it look like? Uh, this is the web page from 12 months ago. Let's train it on that and then run it against the current web page. What we found is when it was 18 months old, we were 91.7%, um, uh, I believe it was, uh, accurate in finding the same elements on the page. And at 12 months, it went up to like 96.2, um, something like that. Uh, I can grab the exact numbers, but 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 again, it's all visually. If you look under the hood, um, and we did this analysis as well, a fair number of those websites were rewritten. Any selectors that we could have built changed both, you know, uh, XPath, but also just CSS class names, uh, things like that modified. And so um, using visual, we were able to find it in those, but we still missed, it. it's not 100%. But um, with those, um, our theory is that AI is not taking over jobs. It's really meant more as a, a, an ability to help augment and you know, be a force multiplier for automation and engineers and developers. So I have one from online. Yeah. How do AI systems go with testing complex systems or systems where you are testing whether complex business processes meet their end-to-end -end business workflow requirements? For example, Testing the business processes of core banking systems and their inter interaction with the CRM, internet banking app, telephony system, et cetera. So wow, that <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, yeah, so I think with something like that, right? Uh, if you have exact core use cases, it's probably, you know, something like that is, is far more learned and deeper. I think you have to really give it either good training data with when you go deep, or AI is probably not the greatest, right? So AI is really great. Like uh, hopefully I, I've shown, it's really good at sort of these generic pieces, right? Um, you have to give it a bunch of dogs to find dogs. You have to train it on your data to know your data. But if it's this very complicated system, it can't really learn all the intricacies with a small data set. So if, if you have limited data and a complex system uh, for your business logic, it might be best to not use it to, you know, do that core, you know, flow and understanding it, but instead what you could use it for is, you know, parts of it. So um, when you go to the CRM, you have to log in. Um, using AI, AI to log in and handle that, because that's a generic piece, 
you can do that. So you don't have to be worried about, oh, the they changed the login page for my CRM, now it breaks, um, things like that. Uh, being able to learn generically what a API needs. Um, there's there's AI systems out there today that can look at an AI uh, API web page and then uh, actually codify what the API looks like and all those values. So that's, I think, where you would need it is not to use it holistically as, as a, a replacement for testing these large systems, but instead use it as a tool um, within your uh, suite of things, within your suite of tests. Can you give examples of uh, open source AI testing frameworks that you can use in the and frameworks? open source testing frameworks. So we released a open source uh, AI uh, uh, tool uh, plugin for Appium and I believe it got ported to Selenium as well. Um, where is it? Got it. Yeah, so there is, um, you could look at the implementation within Appium and Selenium and it would be probably similar um, within that. So you can, um, Dione, get, Dione has a talk on, on Wednesday. I can I can link you to a blog post that we wrote. So at Test AI, we did open source a bunch of um, uh, AI-based models and integration. And so you can take those same models and that same approach and apply it to WebDriver, but it's not plug and play today. Um, uh, my company has a open source WebDriver IO plugin where you can, um, do that, but we just uh, we we haven't gotten a chance to open source the back end yet. So um, that will be that'll be soon. Um, specifically for WebDriver IO, uh, DevTools AI is 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 that coming? Um, and then I'm trying to think of the other um, one that I'm thinking of is uh, uh, um, there's uh, 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 I mean, obviously open source OCR uh, using ML, Kara's OCR is a good example of that one where you can train it to do, look at an image and grab the text and then, um, uh, am I blinking? And then there's one for um, image diffing as well that's open source using machine learning. I, I could grab that as well. Yes. So like the prospect of using AI to kind of um, determine maybe thousands of potential tests is certainly exciting. I don't think do that. But I think the most you know, the scary part then is how do you bring the process of methodology of like, of those thousands of potentially useful tests, identify the ones that are actually useful, where they have to really like check for and satisfy requirements. Because we might be one thing to say um I expect dog. But in fact, maybe the actual requirement ought to be I expect this to be um, So, like, like it seems like maybe the AI, um, I don't know, it's a period of awesome, or the AI can help clean the data and help you pick. So, the question is, is AI can generate a lot of test cases, but um, how do you know that those test cases are good and how can it assist in that? And I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think. As of right now, it's it's yeah, it's probably a little bit uh, requires that human trust um, to kind of be built into it in the same way that like a lot of people don't trust self driving cars today, um, and so you need to um, there needs to be a lot more data on that, and so um, I think the the key thing is going to be when you start to see um, certain companies able to are able to have very high quality and, and you start to, um, ask them why, and they'll start to say, oh, we're using AI to, to do it. The second piece I think to that is you can, um, uh, look at the, you know, same, same metrics that you have for, uh, testing and quality today. So things like code coverage, um, analytics from your user side, things like that to then, um, look at those. So, um, one, one, one thing that we did at, at Google was, um, in an internal environment. And we would, we would say, um, here's, here's kind of the ecosystem that we have. And we had all the analytics for, um, what users did. This was on Google play. You know, they would, um, 50% of users would come in from a deep link and 53% 47% came directly open the app. And then, you know, of that, they went to search or install whatever. Um, and so we could basically generate uh, user flow to, to synthetically uh, mock that same traffic level. And then we would we take the app, put it in a test environment, and then make sure, 
oh, cool, all of our analytics are the same, right? So if we if we run uh, a thousand of these tests in our mock environment with a pre-production app, pre-production backend, we simulate the end user, do our analytics look the same? Does the data you know that the server served look the same? And start to kind of look at it at that statistical noise level beforehand um, without having to say like, oh, it's uh, it was supposed to be an animal, but it failed because it's a dog. And so using it in that those approaches is also a possibility of not necessarily those hardcore rigorous yes, no's, but using it at a larger scale to say in aggregate, it looks good or it doesn't look good. And here's the anomalies to go investigate. Oh, yes. So I noticed my theory, um, depending on the situation, was only on the two weeks per year model, or only you know when your model is pretty good. Yeah. So the question is, how do you know when, when to stop training? How do you know if it's trained well? So, um, yeah, it's a great question. So if you, uh, you tend to have a, a curve for like a loss curve of, you know, how much is it learning? What is the precision? What is the recall? If you um, overtrain it, then it will only really know and work on your, your data super well. And so it'll, you know, if you gave it only pictures of golden retrievers, it, it might start to kind of learn the general what a dog is and then say, oh, but it has to have, you know, golden hair and, and long and fluffy and things like that. Um, so, so typically what you do is you, you stop it early once you stop learning as much, because that tends to be where, where um, it peaks is you, know, you get to this point where the loss or the, the improvement level starts to degrade and it starts to plateau and that's typically a good good spot to stop and so you measure that based upon the precision and recall of of that test set does that answer the question or yes <gasps> um, i was looking for that in so i was using AWS machine learning uh -huh. um, i was kind of looking for that but so i was really scared um but yeah, I think for the, like the AWS machine learning stuff, they um, have a checkbox, if I recall correctly, where it says, you know, like allow early termination or early uh, uh, exit if, if it hits a certain, uh, if it starts to slow down its training process, just to save you time and money and uh, on that. Please. So in Colorado this summer, we had a situation where an AI was trained by an artist to draw a picture yeah. and screams and cries went out of what the artist used and that somehow you know, that that wasn't fair. Um, but what occurred to me is um, it was just a tool, like an artist uses paint brushes and other tools and colors. And that, yes, this is a new, different kind of tool, but it's a tool in the West. So my question is, as we start incorporating things like what you're working on into our test plans and the test systems and our testing, do we have a responsibility to close that? You know, yes, we've got 10 real testers and one or two AIs, you know, cranking behind the scene uh, in, in disclosing to the customers and users that this is about the testing. Is that, is that a responsibility? Yeah. So the question is, is there a responsibility um, to disclose, you know, how much of a, a testing system or services AI versus humans? I, I think it's a it, fascinating question. I hadn't ever thought of that. Um, to be fair, I think my, my thought has always been like, if, if, if someone's interested, you should say it, but tell them, but ultimately does anyone really care how kind of that sausage is made, right? Like when, when you use Amazon or, Google or whatever, right? If you go to Amazon homepage and, and they give you a really good recommendation for a product, um, do you care if it was some human who, you know, found out and looked at your shopping history, your shopping pattern and said, oh yeah, this is great. Or if it's a machine, I, I, I personally don't. I think it's it's cool when it's like, oh yeah, I was just thinking about buying, you know, new shoes or something, right? And Amazon has a, a good shoe pair, but it, it'll be, I think, an ethical question that for sure that'll start to come up as, as this goes, especially as... Um, I think around the data that goes. So these systems require a lot of data typically. And so then it's, well, if a machine learning system is using this or an AI agent is using this um, or testing my app, is that is that data then going to be applied and, and used for the next set of things that might be proprietary? And how does that work in terms of sharing credit? Can I ask yeah. about that? So I just read this article yesterday about Amazon suggesting to teenagers buying sodium nitrate <laughs> really true, right? Yeah. How do you, uh, 
uh, I guess an Amazon published the suicide and uh, anti compulsive <laughs> thing. And so, you know, it just said, like, well, maybe we don't really care. And it might be an ethical question. We'll see in that. I mean, I didn't even get a Oh, yeah. And then things like that. What happens there, with, for example, the liability um, for the fact that children are dead now because Amazon suggested to them to buy these things together? One third of all, well, here it's taken tables, you know, type of your code in ninth grade while you're reading a book about how to play <laughs> that is a very, yeah, it's an interesting quorum. So the question is, you know, Amazon recently uh, got in trouble for um, auto-suggesting sodium nitrate and suicide books to teens who then purchased them and ended up killing themselves. And uh, it was all because a machine learning system did that. And I think it's the same kind of moral question that Google faced in the early 2000s around if someone searches for suicide, uh, do they show you the best, you know, for, like, do they answer your question of the best forms of suicide? And, and they took a very strong stance and said, hey, we're going to have humans look at some of these queries and and, and uh, allow lists some of them um, and uh, deny lists others around around that. So now if you search, how do you kill yourself on Google, for instance, they give you the suicide uh, prevention hotline and they have a manual set of results, right? But that's, again, the, the same thing of um, for, for particular cases like that, um, you know, how do you determine something? And I think a lot of that has to go into, um, you know, edge case detection um, and 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 those pieces. I think are, are we out of? We are, we're actually over time. Oh, sorry. I've got a couple more online questions, but certainly feel free to uh, go. Uh, we're going into a break now, and then at 11.30, we've got uh, Jane Holland, uh, what quality code got to do with it? So, um, I believe so. Or downstairs or upstairs? I think it's upstairs. I don't know where. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I had to ask too, right? Um, okay. <laughs> Everything's down because you're Colorado, right? That's a yeah. mile high. So we got a couple more questions. Chris, if you want to yeah. go with them. Um, what are the percentages of false negatives that come from AI? It, uh, so percentage of uh, questions or percentage of false negatives, it, it depends system by system. Um, like at least typically what we've trained for for testing pieces uh, is you want the fewest number of false negatives. So you want to be very accurate and very sure of whatever you interact with is um, correct. And that's, I think, the, just the testing pieces. You're taking a level of uncertainty and you need to lower that uncertainty as low as you can. So it's better to have a, uh, uh, a false negative or better to have a false negative than it is to have a false positive. And then the last question from online. Uh, you have shown how AI overcomes many of the issues that traditional high-level test automation runs into, but its overall maintenance for the long term improves. Yeah. So overall, uh, what? So this is this is an interesting piece I forgot to mention. Is yeah, with with traditional automation, your automation is going to be the best it ever will be the day you check it in, right? Because you have all the system; it's locked. Um, what you trained it on, an AI system is actually reversed. It's going to be its worst the day you check it in because it has the least amount of data. But as this starts to roll, right, it starts to learn more and more. So, you know, um, uh, you know, it has just the examples that you have of the shopping cart. Well, you know, designers do their thing and they tweak the shopping cart. And then it'll start to learn all the different variations of your shopping cart. And it'll get better because then, you know, if someone rolls that change back, it'll know both shopping carts. It'll know both of those aspects. And so um, the maintenance cost actually goes down. Uh, over time with these systems, um, just because it gets additional training data, it learns uh, this particular app better and better. And with more data, it just gets uh, cleaner and cleaner. Um, so Chris's contact information, you see it on the slide there. Yeah. Um, keep up with him, follow what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, reach out. Chris, yeah. any last words? <laughs> no, no, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming to the talk. And uh... <laughs>